Hey guys, what is going on? Jurgen from Zerg Reno Sports here coming at you with the January 25th edition of Raw Review. Quickly before we get into the review, if you would like to support me and the channel, you can do so over at Patreon. It'll be the first link in the description. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you're able to and you'd like to help the boy out, that'd be great. If not, that's A-OK. -okay. Um, at the end of the video, uh, let me know what you guys thought of Raw down in the comments and all that stuff. Did you like it? Did you dislike it? And then uh, also follow me on Twitter and leave a like if you enjoyed the review. But without all, you know, having all that, you know, um, intro self-promo stuff out the way let's get into the review um raw raw was not good once again um right now in my head after just finishing watched it i i feel like it wasn't as bad as last week but i feel like by the end of the episode end of the review I'm going to change my mind and be like, this was utter shit. Because there were some things that I had minor grievances with. There were some things that I had major grievances with. Um, and then there was only a handful of things or less that I that I enjoyed about the show. So, um, yeah. Without further ado, let's get into it. We started off with a Drew promo. Uh, he came out saying how it was great to be back. And he thanked all his fans for all the get well wishes that he received and stuff like that. And then he dedicated the match on Sunday to uh, people, you know, with COVID who are battling COVID. So um, if WWE has Goldberg go over, they're pretty much saying, hey, everybody who died from COVID and everybody who might die, uh, get fucked. We don't give a shit. So that's great. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and then he... Um, he transitioned to talking about his actual promo after the COVID stuff by saying, talking about things people are sick of, which was a good burn at, uh, at Goldberg. He mentioned how um, he would be foolish to take Goldberg lightly. Uh, he put over his whole career as like, oh man, I remember watching him, you know, uh, develop in a system that wasn't, you know, made for success, going on that undefeated streak, beating Hulk Hogan. Then he came to WWE, he beat Rock, he beat everybody, then he disappeared. And then when he came back, he started a new streak. Whenever he would challenge uh, for a championship, he would win, and he's going to end that streak at the Royal Rumble. The Miz would then interrupt, uh, compare Drew versus Goldberg to Kong versus Godzilla, because, you know, topical. Um... And uh, he said it would be like a hellacious match or something. And usually when there's a hellacious match, there are consequences like being injured. Um, and then him and Morrison are saying how whoever's left standing is pretty much a sitting duck. Uh, Miz and Morrison will beat the fuck out them essentially. And then Miz will cash in. Uh, then Goldberg comes out. He comes out to the ring, stares down. Drew stands off with him. You, me, Sunday, you're next. So the caveman promo that he should stick to instead of that fucking, you know, promo that he cut against the voices in his head a few weeks ago on Legends Night. Um... Just straight and to the point, which is fine. I don't want to hear Goldberg speak more than that, really. Um, then Miz and Morrison try and incite them to fight each other. They're like, hey, Drew, he just disrespected you. Go fight him. Uh, they're on the apron at this point. Then, you know, Drew and Goldberg look at them, look back at each other, bring them both into the ring. Goldberg spear to Miz. Drew uh, broke kick to Morrison. Then they stare down with Drew raising the championship. Um, and that is pretty much the final uh, confrontation between them those two going into the pay-per-view um that was fine for what it was i didn't have too much of a problem with that drew's part of the promo was fine as much as i dislike miz still being money in the bank i would really really like it if they would just retroactively just be like hey uh hey miz remember me aj styles you screwed me over you said you'd do anything to make it up to me you give me a match for that money in the bank brother uh and that way you can have the money in the bank on somebody believable because <laughs> It's 2021. I'm sorry, Miz. 2016 was your time. You should have gotten the WWE title run. Um, but it's 2021. I don't think anybody really wants to see that um, too much now. So I'm not really a fan of him being money in the bank. But with that aside, since that's a personal preference thing, that's not like an objective thing. Um, 
I think that, you know, him saying like, hey, you guys are going to beat the fuck out of each other. You're big, beefy boys. And then I'm going to capitalize as a heel money in the bank holder. That's all good shit, right? That makes sense. So uh, that was fine. Goldberg's promo, like I said, keep him speaking as little as possible and he's fine. Um, so overall, the promo was okay. Uh, you got Drew and Goldberg looking strong at the expense of Miz and Morrison um, going in and then... You know, there you go. Uh, then we had a Charlotte backstage interview where uh, she was asked about just what how things are going, I guess. Uh, she says that she performs well under pressure. Um, she uh, talks about... Um, you know, the, the, the interviewer mentioned that she's going to face, you know, the Queen of Spades, Shayna. And she says it's one thing to call yourself a queen and the other to be one. But... But, like, I, I understand the point of the promo. The only issue is you just call yourself a queen as well. Because there is no queen of the ring tournament. Like, there was a king of the ring tournament. You haven't won the title of queen. So, like, I understand it's a burn at, like, oh, you call yourself the queen. I am the queen. But you're not the queen. You didn't rightfully win it. You just call yourself the queen as well. Maybe you started doing it first. But, like... That doesn't mean you are the queen. So, you know, Charlotte face promo being shit. Who would have thought? Um, she talks about how she defies the odds. She bets on herself. And that's why they call her Mrs. WrestleMania. Um, she was asked about Lacey and Rick. Uh, she said that she's experienced some of Rick's darkest times. And she thinks this is the darkest one yet, which is which which is pretty weird considering he almost died a couple of years ago. He had years of, like, drug abuse, I'm pretty sure, earlier in his career, maybe, like, 80s, 90s. He almost died in a plane crash. But him teaching Lacey Evans some moves and then potentially getting some action on the side is the darkest part of his career, yeah. Charlotte is really a horrible babyface promo. Um, granted, it's probably being written for her, but, yeah, it is what it is. Um... Then she was talking about how it's one thing to have the name Flair versus carry the name Flair, which I think she was insinuating that Lacey was trying to cradle rob or whatever it's called when, you know, gold dig kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. Then they had Charlotte versus Shayna with Nia in her corner, obviously. Um, during Charlotte's entrance, when she does her uh, pose, Kevin Dunn cut to an arena shot in an arena where there's no fucking fans. And where one of your star women's performance is doing her traditional entrance pose. Get this man unemployed from WWE. Get him out of his production position, man. The guy stinks. This brother stinks, man. Fucking Kevin Dunn. Uh, Charlotte goes for a figure eight really early on. I feel like it was only like a couple minutes in the match. She goes for the figure eight before she bridges. Nia leg drops, causes the DQ. Uh, then they start beating her down. Mandy and Dana come down for the save. Lacey also comes down. And then they go to commercial during, uh, during the six of them brawling. So, you know, a holla, holla, holla play was coming. You just knew a holla 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 play was coming. Then they came back and they had started the match as a six man uh, Charlotte, Mandy, and Dana versus Lacey, Shayna, and Nia. Um, Lacey started the match with, I think it was Dana. When Dana tags in, Charlotte, Lacey immediately tags out. So that was uh, advancing the feud between them. Then they have a moment where Charlotte and Shayna are outside. And then Charlotte's like staring down Lacey and Nia. And then Shayna like pushes Charlotte in the ring and then tries to go in the ring, but they count her out. And then they gave the win to Charlotte, um, Dana, and Mandy. Now, here's the thing. If this is a botch, then it's unfortunate. If that was intentional, they made Shayna look like the dumbest person on the roster. And that's Shayna fucking Baszler. She's one of the best people you have in that women's division. And you're making her look dumb as fuck. If that was intentional. From what I understand, from what I've heard in like podcasts and interviews and shoot interviews and stuff like that. The refs, apart from the parts of the match where they're intentionally supposed to miss stuff. Like through ref bumps or being distracted. 
they're reportedly told to call it like a shoot. So if they see something happen that would cause a disqualification or a count out or something and somebody misses the count, they're supposed to call it like a shoot and, you know, end the match. So I wouldn't blame the ref for this. I wouldn't blame John Cohn if anybody was. So it was either a timing botch between Charlotte and um, Shayna or it was intentional, which just makes it fucking which makes Shayna look fucking dumb as shit. Uh, we go to commercial, then we come back to the march, the march, the match happening again because it was restarted during commercial because the heels surrounded Adam Pierce, who was then like, oh, you think it's unfair? You want a rematch? And the faces were like, okay, bring it on. He's like, okay, it's officially a rematch. Um, so... Yeah, um, there's a point where Nia tags in off of Lacey after um, attacking Charlotte a bit. Lacey tries to drag Charlotte out and beat her up, but Charlotte uh, is not fully incapacitated. She stares her down and kind of chases her out of the ringside area. Um, and then Nia ends up pinning Dana Brooke after seemingly concussing her. Um, why? You know what I mean? Like, why? Like, if you want to have the heels win, that's fine, right? But, like, at least get Shayna to, to get the pinfall. Why does, like, Naya did, like, she, she picked up Dana for, like, a, like, it looked like a powerbomb. And then she kind of slipped her hand through to go for, like, a choke slam. But instead of, like, protecting her and carrying her the way down, she just kind of, like, put her up. And then, like, swung her other arm underneath her legs and kind of just pendulum swinged her down. Head first, almost. Um... To, to the mat and it looked awful I would not be surprised if Dana has a concussion Nia Jax looks like one of the most unsafe workers you can have and if she was from another family she would not even be employed let alone be on television so it begs the question you know like how much power does the NOI family have in the business a lot <laughs> because Nia Jax is employed on WWE television. So, um, yeah, I don't know why you need to give Nia the win. You've been protecting her by not having her take actual losses in recent weeks, which you don't need to do because she's fucking garbage. Um, you could have put over Shayna, which who you, by the way, made look like a fucking idiot if that was intentional. The count out thing. Um, and like, it's just why... Why are you doing the fucking singles leading to the tag, leading to the second tag? You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it, this was awful from start to finish. Don't, don't do Shayna versus Nia if you're just, or sorry, Shayna versus Charlotte. If you're just going to do the six man, just do the six man. You can book a six man tag match without having a brawl during a match to cause it. Just book the six-man tag. Because then you can do Shayna and Charlotte for, for real with actual time later down the road without it getting inter interrupted because those two are good wrestlers and they would have a good match. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, it's just the whole, the whole segment from the singles to the tag to the tag just made no sense it didn't really help anybody get over except for naya who doesn't fucking need it because she's garbage she should not be on television um it's just mind-boggling how the fuck somebody got paid to come up with that you know what i mean like somebody got paid good money on the writing team, on the creative team, unless it was Vince just, like, overwriting it, and Vince gets paid well anyways. But, like, somebody, whether it be a creative member or Vince himself or a combination of both, came up with that, thought, yeah, that's good shit, book it, and they got paid handsomely for it. It boggles my fucking mind because it was so goddamn shit, man. It was so bad. Um, that was awful. I think Charlotte, by the way, in her interview mentioned that she's defending the titles at Rumble, which I, hasn't even been announced with a match graphic, I don't think. I don't know if, I can't remember if they mentioned it on commentary, but yeah. Um, 
So yeah, overall, like, the match quality was shit. The first match didn't count because it was, like, a minute or two and then it got interrupted, so that doesn't count. There's no match quality there. The first tag match was shit with a shit finish, whether it was a botch or intentional, but the fact that they restarted it and he did count 10, and the fact that Lacey um, was yelling at Shayna that she had one job and then counted 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, she did that during while yelling at her, that makes me think it was intentional to create a restart so, like, fucking why? Like, all three variations of the match that they tried to do were poor quality-wise, except for an impressive uh, Mandy Rose. Uh, I can't remember if it was a hot tag or not. I think it was, but Mandy had a, an impressive... Um, you know, stretch of offense, which looked really good. So I liked that. Um, but like the match quality was shit. The finishes were shit. You put over the one person of the six that doesn't need to be put over. And then you made the best person out of the six look like a fucking dumbass. Like it's just, it doesn't make sense. Awful, awful stuff. Then we move on to um, an Ali backstage um, promo that they said happened after last week, um, saying how, you know, Kofi and Woods and the New Day, they're there to help people escape from reality, but Ali and Retribution are there to serve as a reminder to reality, which I liked. Ali is a fucking fantastic promo. Then they had an earlier today uh, promo segment from Ali saying how the best moment of Kofi's life was because of the worst moment of Ali's life. He says that Kofi mania happened at his expense and that his spot in the chamber was Ali's spot in the chamber and his spot at mania was Ali's spot at mania kind of thing. So once again, putting over uh, that gimmick. You might think, hey, why didn't this happen as soon as Ali came back? Uh, because WWE probably forgot that they booked it. Um... I'm happy that they're elaborating on this, though. I really just, I really fucking want Kofi versus Ali singles at Mania. Um, I feel kind of bad for Woods, just on a little sidebar before we continue with the review. I feel kind of bad for Woods because for me personally, Woods has always been the third most important member of, of New Day. For me personally, the, the ranking of New Day members has been Kofi, Big E, and then, and then Woods for me. Uh, Big E will probably have the bigger career overall um, by the end of everybody's careers. So maybe Big E in terms of career success and stuff like that and overall heights reached might overtake Kofi. But I think Kofi was probably the best part of New Day followed by Big E, followed by Woods. Now I'm kind of I feel bad a little bit for Woods because I don't know how he would do as a singles guy and I don't know how much left they want to do of New Day. Um, I don't know what the financial figures that New Day brings in are. If they're still high, they're definitely going to keep them going. But they might have dipped a bit after Big E uh, got separated from them. And uh, Kofi can absolutely go on his own. Woods can have a good singles match as well. It's just I don't know how Woods would work as a singles performer overall. So I kind of feel bad for him that maybe he'll be left out of Mania. Because I think the logical way to you know pay off this Retribution New Day stuff is Ali and Kofi in a singles. I think that that should happen at Mania. Um... I think maybe have um, Woods and and uh, and and Kofi New Day maybe get two more people to join them to have like a um, a four on four kind of thing at Elimination Chamber uh, or get one person to join them to have a three on three the three members of Retribution with Ali at like ringside or something and then eventually do Ali and and Kofi at Mania because I think that's the natural and the logical conclusion to that storyline which kind of leaves Woods a little bit left out. Um, which is unfortunate because it means Woods wouldn't have wrestled at three manias in a row because Kofi won two manias ago. Last mania, Kofi was in a singles triple threat for the tag titles because of COVID. And then it would mean that Woods misses out on wrestling at mania three years in a row, which would really be like unfortunate because he's so good. I just think that that's the natural progression. So I feel I, I feel sorry for Woods that the natural logical progression of the story kind of leaves him out. We'll have to wait and see if WWE go with the logical natural progression of the story or if they don't. Um, but 
I just thought I'd mention that because I think that that is where it should go. Uh, but anyways, this was all leading up to a Woods versus Slapjack match. Uh, Mia Yim was there this week, so I don't know why she wasn't there last week. Maybe a COVID thing. Uh, maybe she tested positive or something and then wasn't allowed in. Or maybe she had contacted somebody who was positive and didn't get her results back or something. I don't really know, but she was there this week and she wasn't there last week. Um... The match itself was fine. Slapjack has some pretty offensive offense. Or Shane Thorne, if you don't want to, you know, discredit him with that awful name. Um, but then uh, they, they have a good match. They have a decent match. Some decent maneuvers being exchanged. Then Ali instructs T-Bar to distract Woods. Uh, Slapjack does a roll-up from behind or a schoolboy, I guess, whatever you want to call it. Um, Woods rolls through it, hits the Shining Wizard, and wins. Um, Ali gets in the ring. Woods backs out of the ring into a big boot from T-Bar. And then they have a post-match assault. T-Bar and Mace, I think. The guy who used to be on commentary on Raw. Um, they did the they did like a double choke slam kind of thing to him. And then they kind of hold him up by the arms. Kind of like um kind of like Batista did with Randy after Evolution turned on Randy. You know what I mean? Kind of like that, if you need a visual and you didn't watch. Um Ali instructs Slapjack to get him a chair. Ali gets it, faints like he's going to hit him over the head with the chair, stops midway through, uh, sets the chair up to sit down, sits down on the chair, orders Mia Yim to grab him a mic, and then he grabs the mic and he talks about how Woods has all, has, you know, all this talk about being king of the ring, but right now you look like a peasant, Woods. Um, I'm going to act like a king and show mercy. And because I'm showing mercy, you're going to do what I, you know, do what I say. And what I say is to send a message to Kofi. And uh, he said that, you know, he was really uh, saddened to hear that Kofi would not be competing in the Rumble, but a replacement has been found, which is Ali. So um, Ali's a great promo. Maybe I think Ali's promo is probably the best part of that first. I feel like we were about an hour into Raw at this point, uh, maybe a little bit under. But I think Ali has Ali's promos, the one from last week, the one from earlier today, and then the one post match. Um, Ali was the best part of the show to this to this moment, uh, in my opinion. So yeah, Ali's a great promo. Um, so I'm once again, I really hope that they pay it off with Kofi versus Ali at Mania because the promos leading up to it would be great. The match quality would be great. And then you could put over Ali huge by having him win a singles match against Kofi, who is a former WWE champion. Um, so you could put over Ali huge if you do it right, which means they're not going to do it. Um, then they had a Riddle and Truth backstage segment where um, Riddle, uh, sorry, Truth was talking about how uh, he overheard Hurt Business were throwing a surprise party for him in the vip lounge later tonight um and then him and truth just make jokes back and forth and and that was that it was pretty much a non-segment but the segment ended off with our truth exiting the screen and riddle saying oh i have an idea um then we come back i think from commercial for the vip lounge with the hurt business um MVP mentions how he's stoked about Bad Bunny and how the after party is going to be awesome with all the Latina chicks and stuff. Uh, so basically, MVP woke up super horny today. Um, he, he kept calling Lashley Roberto, which I found kind of funny. Um, he, he said that... Um, you know, they had to focus on the task at hand in a gauntlet match with Riddle later tonight, which we'll get to, obviously. Um, and he specifically mentioned Cedric, how, you know, Cedric needs to, you know, keep his keep focused on the task. Um, MVP had mentioned how Lashley requested for the VIP lounge. But before that, he would talk about the gauntlet. Uh, Lashley basically puts over MVP, um, saying that you just kind of need somebody to believe in you to kind of get you on the right way. And MVP was that guy. And now they all believe in themselves. And it's only the beginning for the Hurt Business success, pretty much. Then Shelton is uh, about to cut a promo. He gets a few words in. And then Cedric interrupts him, saying, I think what he meant to say is blah, blah, blah. Um, and then basically, uh, Lash is like, listen, we're all dripped in gold. So we thought it would be, it'd only be right if you were dripped in gold too. They give him a gold necklace that says THB for the Hurt Business, obviously, on it. Cedric takes kind of credit for it, saying how he was working with the designer. Shelton kind of takes offense to it. He's like, wait, wait, wait. When you were working the designer, you didn't have any idea what was going on. 
Truth music plays. He's coming out. MVP's just the whole time through his entrance. He's like, like, why are you here? Why are you here? Why are you out here? Um, and then there's surprise party confusion about Truth saying, I heard you guys had a surprise party. It's weird to not have your guest on the on the list. And they're like, you're not you're not invited. You're not on the, you're not a guest. Um, and he's like, what, what do you mean? I thought you were so throwing me a surprise birthday party uh, for my birthday last week. I thought everybody forgot. They're like, this isn't for you. He's like, oh come on, THB truth happy birthday which actually got an actual pop out of me i'm ashamed to say uh lash is like oh you know what truth we you know we did get you a gift if you just get in the ring obviously goading him into a beatdown. but the, then the 24 7 division jobbers come down um and then the hurt business kind of beat them up after they try and roll up truth which they uh unsuccessfully attempt while the hurt business is on the outside beating up the jobbers from the 24-7 division, Riddle goes in with a hit and run on MVP with a knee to the face, and then he flees kind of thing, and they're like, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna get yours later tonight kind of thing, so, um, yeah, I, I like the VIP lounge, um, I liked the giving him gold thing, because it is kind of weird that you have four members of the stable, and three of them have gold, and the other one doesn't, I think, the, the thing is, MVP probably shouldn't be a champion as, like, he's done great work in 2020 and now into 2021 with the Hurt Business. I don't think MVP should really be a champion in the year 2021. Um, so it is kind of, you know, weird. Um, I think maybe what they could do down the line is have uh, MVP be US champion and then Lashley win the WWE title off of uh, Drew or something like that down the line and then for like a week or a month or something not a week for like a month or something you could have the whole you know roster blinged out and then you could have them lose their titles one by one with Lashley kind of like snapping on them but this is like months in the future you know what I mean no, I, I don't. They're they're teasing up the breakout, or at least Cedric being kicked out. But I I don't think they should do that just yet. Um, but uh, yeah. So that segment was fine. I didn't really like the jobbers coming out. That was whatever. Um, I thought it was fine to to involve Truth just because Truth is pretty funny, and they had a good segment with Truth on Raw Talk where he's uh where he was talking about how they look like they they could eat a good sack of nuts, um obviously meaning like the the food, um but obviously it sounds like balls nuts even um and then they got heated with Truth that was a really funny Raw Talk segment so they just kind of played off of that with some more our Truth in there which is fine. Um, then in the backstage, we come back from a commercial, uh, truth is backstage sitting standing beside like a baseball statue pretending to use his title as a baseball bat in a pose pretending to be a statue i guess hiding from the 24 7 division um pierce is walking by truth wants an opportunity to qualify for the money in the bank ladder match aj interrupts says he'd love to give Tru uh truth an opportunity to qualify for the royal rumble match he thinks he means um AJ says he's a nice guy. There's another word for it. He asks almost almost says benevolent. Um, and then, uh, Pierce is like, yeah, okay. Truth. If you can beat, uh, AJ tonight, then I will put it into consideration to put you in the rumble match. Um, Truth makes some like star sign uh, jokes about the benevolent thing. He's like, oh, you're benevolent? I'm a Capricorn. I bet you're a Taurus almost. And I had this Taurus and this and that. And then, yeah. Um, so that was a fine segment. I like what they're doing with AJ in the sense that they don't really have any ready-made storylines that make sense, I guess, right now for AJ, except for, in my opinion, him wanting the money in the bank from um, Miz. I think that that would be a good story instead of, you know, interjecting Miz into the, into the Goldberg-Drew stuff. I think it would be better if you just once again, have AJ be like, hey, you said you'd, you'd do anything to make it up to me. You ruined my chance. Give me a shot at the money in the bank. I think that would make perfect sense. But um, I don't know. Maybe they'll do that after the Rumble. Maybe they just want to kind of hold it off kind of thing. Um, but yeah, um, so I like what they're doing with AJ. They're, they're, they're finding an intriguing way, I guess, to put AJ over every week, give him good wins, make him look strong for the Rumble. Um, granted, they're doing it based on logic that is illogical. Um, the whole some people can can declare and some people have to qualify shit. I've already discussed how much I hate that. Either everybody has to declare or everybody, or sorry, everybody can declare or everybody has to qualify kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, 
well, not everybody has to qualify, but have qualifiers and then have surprises on the night, right? You can't just go into a rumble with all 30 people like laid out really um, in real life um, because the a big part of the rumble is the surprises, you know what I mean? So yeah, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm liking what they're doing with AJ. Uh, then we had Sheamus versus Morrison, obviously with Miz in his corner. Uh, I think they announced on commentary that Sheamus had declared for the rumble or something like that. Um, John Morrison is so goddamn good. He had so much really good looking offense. He sells really well. And it just, I really, really, it's a big shame. Although he's really good in the comedic sidekick role that he's portraying right now, it's a shame that they have him in that role because he could be doing so much more. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. Morrison can be doing so much more. Uh, but for the time being, he's stuck with Miz. <clears throat> Excuse me. May, may, you know, maybe what they'll do is maybe they'll do the AJ thing, get the money in the bank on AJ and then have Miz blame Morrison and then you could split them up kind of thing and do Miz and Morrison at Mania. Um, that's something that you could do and then put Morrison over kind of thing and then he can go on to a mid-card feud and then a world title feud potentially. Um, I don't know if I'd want to see him as world champion in WWE, but... Um, just give him like a serious uh, singles run. That'd be really good. Uh, but basically, after a very good match, very, very good match, uh, Sheamus wins and then Miz immediately gets on the mic. And he's like, whoa, whoa hey, Sheamus, you want to you want to prepare for the Rumble? Well, you got your head's on a swivel. You know that. So I challenge you right now to a handicap me and Morrison versus you right now. Um, and then Sheamus is like, all right, bring it on. Um, why? You did this last week like three times. And now you're doing it again. Granted, I think they're working these shows with limited um, rosters, like short. I think they're short on personnel. Um, so I guess there's some understanding that that's why they're doing it. It's just like, why? You know what I mean? Like, this doesn't help anybody. Because guess what? Spoiler alert. Miz and Morrison win the handicap. Why wouldn't they? It's after a grueling singles match, and then there's a new fresh guy and a numbers advantage. If you have Sheamus win both, Sheamus looks really strong, but you make Miz and Morrison look awful. If you have Miz and Morrison win the second match, Sheamus gets nothing, Morrison gets nothing, Miz looks strong, but not really strong because he only capitalized on, like, granted that fits in Miz's character, capitalizing on opportunities, but... Yeah. Um, granted, in the handicap match, there was a pretty cool um, the the thing that Sheamus does on the apron, the ten beats of whatever the fuck it's called, where he like stretches them out and then beats on their chest. Um, he was doing it to Miz. Morrison comes by to like kick him in the face or elbow him in the face or something. He just kind of moves back. Morrison ends up hitting Miz. Miz falls down and he's like, okay, Morrison's turn, and then puts Morrison. I thought that was a cool spot. Um, then in the finish. Um, Sheamus is going for a bro kick on Miz. Uh, Morrison holds his leg, causes him to turn around, and then Miz gets him for a skull-crushing finale. He escapes the finale, ducks a springboard um, kick from Morrison, um, then does the bro kick to Morrison, and then gets hit by a skull-crushing finale. One, two, three, Miz and Morrison get the win. So yeah, once again, um, Sheamus gets a win which is good. They're building up Sheamus quietly, I feel like, which I think is good because I think he's a dark horse for the Rumble. And I think that they're going to do Drew and Sheamus at Mania, um, which leads me to believe either he's going to win the Rumble and go to do Drew, or if somebody else wins the Rumble, they'll be Roman's guy. Um, so uh, the Rumble's actually kind of unpredictable this year. I'm not going to lie to you. And I'll talk about that. I'm going to be doing a Royal Rumble preview. So I'll talk about it when I do that um, later in the week, probably on Saturday, you'll see that uh, before the pay-per-view. But like, they're actually kind of doing a good job of making the Rumble a little bit unpredictable, you know what I mean? But I think I think Sheamus is a dark horse. I think they'll do Sheamus and Drew at, at Mania. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so, like, they're building up Sheamus slowly but surely and kind of quietly under the radar. He's getting solid wins. Um, but then again, like, this doesn't really serve... Morrison didn't come out with a net positive here. Morrison lost, and then he got carried to a win, essentially, by Miz. Morrison doesn't look that great here other than his performance in the first match, which casual fans won't care about. They just care about who wins and loses, right? Um, Sheamus gets a nice win, but then he gets counteracted with a loss. So in terms of win-loss record, it's a net zero. He's 50-50 booked there. Miz comes out with just a win, but 
and I, I mean, it fits Miz's character, so I guess it's okay for Miz, but it doesn't really do too much for Morrison. Uh, you're kind of putting over Miz at the expense of Morrison, and Sheamus to casuals might not get that big of a rub, um, but to more hardcore fans, he definitely does because he's putting on great matches every week. He's getting solid wins, so they're doing a good job of um, of putting him over kind of under the radar. For me, uh, I will compliment that. That's, yeah. That's something that was okay. I, I really didn't like the restarting as a handicap. They probably should have just left it as a Sheamus win. Um, but what are you going to do? It's WWE, man. It's WWE. What are you going to do? Excuse me as I flip the page in my notebook. That might be getting picked up on the mic. I don't know. Uh, we cut to a backstage a promo. Uh, not really a promo, but a backstage uh, segment with Lacey and Ric Flair practicing moves in a uh, waist lock. Uh, Charlotte walks in, tells Lacey to get out. Lacey kind of like hides behind Rick as she gets out and then like hurries out. Um, Rick's like, just because you're a star now doesn't mean that there isn't a place for me here. Like I am who I am and I'm always going to be the guy I was or something like that. He's who he's always been. And then Charlotte's like, oh, you're you're who you've always been. Okay. You mean the guy who spent money on everything except for his family? Um, you're this and that, blah, blah, blah. And you're just, you're turning from a legend into a, just an old man. And I have no problem saying that to your face. I'm not the bad guy here. She backs away, staring down her dad, turns around into a woman's right from Lacey who walks off with Rick. Rick kind of like bent down. I don't know if it was to check on Charlotte or to like talk shit to Charlotte because the camera position was on Rick's back um, and you could pretty much only see Rick Flair's back, the back of his head and his back bent down with his arm kind of going towards Charlotte. So it's kind it was unsure based just solely on the camera position. It was unsure if he was um, checking to see if she was okay or like saying like that's what you get you little fucking bitch i got him and then uh and then he walks off with lacy and they woo down the corridor and stuff like that uh then we had truth versus aj with Omos or Amos, whatever they're whatever they're calling him now i i wonder if that was just an actual error or if they're just like hey we don't like Omos. we'll call him a moss now and we'll just blame it on aj not saying names right <laughs> i wonder what actually went down with that um AJ has a rumble spot where he gets uh, he gets truth and then he yells, this is what I'm going to do to everybody in the rumble, has him by like the nape of his neck and then he goes to throw him out and then truth reverses it, throws him over the top, AJ's incensed, he goes in, he um, attacks our truth our truth kind of takes a bump near the apron or on the apron, he's kind of like out of it, kind of looking out to the ring, then he kind of looks up at Amos standing there, he's like, oh shit, gets back in the ring, uh, he channels his inner John Cena uh, by doing the um, the Cena signature that he would do before the five knuckle shuffle where like they miss, uh, the opponent misses the uh, clothesline, turns around, gets the back, you know, a spin out thing. And then he does that. And then, uh, he goes for the attitude adjustment, the FU eventually, which AJ reverses into a, um, into rolling into a calf crusher makes our truth submit. Uh, AJ gets a win. They're keeping him strong, uh, building him as a potential favorite for the rumble. I don't think it makes much sense to give AJ the rumble. I think maybe what they're going to do is have AJ kind of be like, listen, Miz, I was going to let it slide because I was just going to go through the rumble. But you know what? That didn't work out. So I want that money in the bank. You said you'd make it up to me and this is how kind of thing. I think maybe they might end up doing that um, to get the money in the bank off Miz because I just I don't know if they want the money in the bank on Miz. Really? Um I don't personally. But again, that's a personal thing. I think Amos might um, eliminate AJ from the rumble. I think they might do that, maybe, or have one of the guys who failed to beat him to qualify eliminate him from the Rumble or something. Or, you know what, maybe uh, maybe Miz, because uh, the Rumble typically main events, right? So maybe, maybe you have the Men's Rumble main event, uh, you have maybe Miz... Um, not a failed cash-in, because then you don't have the money in the bank left, but... Um, Maybe have him like try and cash in, but before he can, uh, there's a mix up where he gets speared out of his boots or bro kicked out of his boots or something, and then they continue the match. So he doesn't officially cash it in. One of those, like, I'm going to cash in, but he doesn't actually give the briefcase to the ref so it doesn't count kind of thing. And then maybe he has to go through the Royal Rumble, and then maybe he eliminates, you know, uh, AJ. And then AJ's like, listen, you screwed me out of the title match at TLC, and then you screwed me out of the Rumble. I want a chance of that money in the bank. Maybe that's what's going to happen. 
Or maybe they'll do uh, somebody who failed to eliminate AJ, eliminating him after getting in the Rumble somehow, or maybe a Moss eliminates him. They have a lot of um, options on who's going to eliminate AJ, so I think they can do a fair few things with that. Um, but uh, yeah, they're doing well with AJ. They're they're booking him strong. They're giving him wins while he doesn't typically have like a story with anybody. He has like a like a he has a program i guess that it, that's just to build him right now but he doesn't have a rivalry with anybody so i think they're doing a good job of keeping him strong while he kind of like a hovers or buffers between stuff so yeah uh they replayed either the entirety or some of randy's promo from last week i didn't really pay attention um because i'm like oh they're just replaying the promo i'm just gonna check on my phone what's going on talk to some people uh then they had an alexis playground in the same vein that they had randy's promo last week where it's promo and then they cut to video package then promo then cut to video then promo then cut to video you don't need that just have alexa recount the story or recall the story without the video you don't need the video. Just have Alexa cut the promo and tell the story like that, whatever. Um, she says a riddle or like a rhyme or something to start off uh, about like a garden or something. She said last week was so much fun. Then to her empty swing seat, she's like, did you see Randy's face after what we did uh, to him? Uh, says she's watching, or sorry, she was, she has a TV in front of her, like a old, like, old tv uh the ones that weigh like 150 pounds uh she's watching a video of luchador randy uh, pretty much um and she's kind of like laughing and then she says yeah she uh, she uh, she's like i agree he looks better too um insinuating that the fiend in the chair i guess told her he looks better with the burned face um she said that last week she just wanted to have some fun with Asuka, um, but Asuka wouldn't play nice and neither would alexa um she said that uh, Fiend taught her the trick of, you know, changing into, like, her Fiend version of herself. Um, and he's taught her a lot of things, and she can't wait until she sees him again to thank him, essentially. Um, and then she said, tonight was an opportunity to win a shiny new toy, which I really dislike. You're really devaluing the title. I understand it's within her character to not put value on the title and this is the issue with putting a character like this in the title position and i've talked about it many times i've talked about it with fiend how fiend should not be in any title matches or title feuds and i've talked about how alexa should not be because here's the thing to these characters a fiend type character that championship literally is just a shiny toy the only problem is you should not promote that because that devalues your championship not only that, the Fiend and Alexa's Fiend variant of herself are supposed to be these unbeatable creatures who know sell shit and can't take damage. You're going to make your champion look like shit every time you put them together in a match, unless it's, unless it's Goldberg. Um, which is still awful, by the way. Um, so it's just, you should not intertwine a Fiend-type character with a championship like almost ever 99% of the time do not intertwine them because something has to give and there are two things that should not interact because none of them should have to make way for the other the champion and the title should not have to look weak or be devalued to make sure that the fiend gimmick stays strong and you should not have to make the fiend look weak or devalue the fiend to make the championship and the champion look strong one of them has to give one of them has to devalue itself to make the other stay at its high value you and that is what the issue is with doing fiend versus champion anytime ever so i really dislike that they're doing it um if you wanted to have alexa maybe after she frees herself from the chains of fiend or maybe have alexa not transform into fiend alexa and just have playground alexa go for the championship that's one thing but what you have to devalue one of them and that is the issue that I have. Because, yes, Alexa, within her character, she should be referring to the championship as a shiny new toy, right? There's no problem with that if you look at it from the Fiend character point of view. But then you kind of look back and look at it from the wrestling point of view and you're like, oh, that makes what these people are fighting for every week a fucking 
useless piece of shit because in th- in the the essence of wrestling is people fight to make a living people wrestle to make a living if you're the champion you make more money you make a better living you want to be the champion right just basic psychology so why are you making the whole reason anybody is wrestling why are you making that seem like a toy right because once again from the fiend stuff from the fiend point of view yeah they don't care about the title the title means nothing to them all they want is destruction and revenge and vengeance and all that stuff they don't give a fuck about the title the title is a toy to them and rightfully so but that's why you don't intermingle them because then something has to give her saying that the title is worthless is a toy makes the title devalued but it makes sense from her end But then again, if the title makes sense from her end, it's just something has to give and that's why you should never intermingle them. So I really, really didn't, didn't like, I don't like that they're intermingling them. I don't have so much issue with her calling it a toy because from her character's perspective, it is just, that's why you don't intermingle them because you devalue something either way you go. Whoever gets put over, whatever you do, something gets devalued. You made Fiend look like a piece of shit at Hell in a Cell because you wanted to keep the champion strong in Seth Rollins. And it deflated the Fiend. And now you're making the title in Asuka look like shit because you need to keep the Fiend character strong. It just, it's it sucks that they're intermingling them because uh, you really shouldn't. Um... She said, just like last week, uh, she doesn't feel like playing nice. Uh, then she does a version of Ring Around the Rosie, uh, Ashes, Ashes, We All Fall Down. As she's saying that, her voice kind of gets distorted. And then uh, her voice has some visual glitches with like fiend-like effects. And then let me in in the fiend's voice to end off that segment. Um, the promo itself, Alexa cuts a good promo. That's been her strong suit the whole time she's been wrestling her in ring hasn't really been that great um in her career but her promos always have been um she cut a good promo for the character she's portraying it's just once again i i know i'm being repetitive and i know i'm saying the same thing over and over again but i think it's important to say it just so you realize how fucking dumb what they're doing is you're devaluing one or the other regardless of what you do and you should not be doing that the uh, the objective that you should be in wrestling for anything you do is to put both people over either in in victory or defeat both acts should be put over in one way or another that that's perfect scenario right sometimes it's not always attainable sometimes it's not always achievable um sometimes you have to have somebody not be put over to put the other person over sometimes it's just you know um a circumstance that just has to happen right but you try and avoid it when you do an intermingling of the fiend and the title there's no avoiding devaluing one or the other which is why you should never do it and why it sucks that they're doing it now so um yeah i don't know the promo was good i like the promo from a fiend universe perspective i just don't like that they're intermingling it because as a result of the promo being good and and being um you know, rooted in itself, in its own universe, in its own psychology, as a result of that, you devalue something else on the show. So it's just, the promo itself was good, but the fact that the way that they're doing it is bad, you know, if that makes any sense to you, um, if that, so overall, I think it's bad for the show, but, you know, in a specific case by case basis, it's good for the Alexa and Fiend stuff. It's just overall detrimental for the show, in my opinion, if that makes any sense. I know I'm retarded, but still. Uh, then we had the Riddle Gauntlet, in which he had to face all of Hurt Business to uh, to get another shot at Lashley's U.S. Championship. Shelton was up first. Um, they had a German supla bebe attempt of by Shelton to Riddle, which uh, Riddle landed on his feet. So that was disappointing. Uh, Shelton is still so fucking good, man. He's so good. Um, Shelton goes. Uh, so they pretty much um, copy and pasted the Billy Kay, Oscar, and Ruby Riot thing that they did on SmackDown recently with Shelton, Cedric, and Riddle. Uh, Riddle goes for the roll-up. Cedric gets up. Uh, Shelton rolls through, has Riddle for a three count in the roll-up. Cedric gets down. Uh, Riddle kicks out. Shelton goes over. He's like, what are you doing? Um, You know, Cedric's like, I was trying to help. MVP's like, just do nothing. Just do nothing. Uh, Shelton turns around after complaining into a roll-up by Riddle. 
and Riddle gets the first win. Uh, MVP's up next. He gets in the ring. Shelton and uh, Cedric are arguing on the outside. He peeks his head out through the middle rope to the outside with his ass showing to Riddle, uh, saying, like, like, just, we have some, just focus on the task at hand. Stop arguing. Bell rings. Um, MVP gets rolled through into what looked like a heel hook by Riddle, uh, and then MVP imme- immediately taps, rolls out, uh, really pissed off. Cedric gets in the ring saying, like, don't worry, I got this. Uh, there was a German soupla bebe in there by uh, Riddle, I think it was. And MVP, throughout the match, after a bunch of pins from, like, Brain Busters and stuff, uh, where Riddle would kick out on two, MVP would yell into the ring, if you hook the head, that won't happen. If you hook the head, he won't be able to kick out. And Cedric's always like, I know, I know, I know. And MVP would be like, yeah, you know too much, is kind of thing. So they have the overconfident Cedric, you know, you know, dissentive, dissension going on kind of thing. Um, and then Cedric would always be like, you know, I got this, I got this, don't worry, and just be overconfident. Um... There was a really cool uh, segment near the end where Riddle was going for a triangle. Cedric would like power bomb out and get caught in and again, and he'd kind of reverse and it would end up in uh, in Riddle. I think rolling up Cedric. Um, I was kind of writing down what was happening as it happened, so I kind of missed the actual motion into the pin. But I think he rolled him up um, from one of those uh, one of those triangle attempts. Um, Riddle gets the win, Lashley attacks him while he's celebrating on the ramp, puts in the Hurt Lock. It looked like it actually hurt Riddle, so I don't know if Riddle's just really good at selling the Hurt Lock or if Lashley actually just fucks up your shoulders and shit when he does that and your neck and traps and stuff, but, uh, yeah. Um, it... I'm... I'm in two minds about this because on one hand it makes sense, but on one hand it's shit. Because you had... The tag team champions and MVP all lose. You had all three members take a loss to give um, Riddle the shot, right? Like, having him beat one of them for a shot, that's fair enough. But having him beat all of them, was that really necessary? I mean, the gauntlet match, in principle, makes sense. But it's just... It's because, the, like, you should probably try and keep your champion strong. I don't know. Um, on the other hand... The reason this made sense is why it shouldn't make sense, if that makes sense. Let me explain. The reason Riddle winning made sense is because he didn't get really definitive wins over Cedric and Shelton. He got roll-ups. One of them being from a distraction. One of them being um, from overconfidence. And then he submitted MVP from a distraction, right? So... You are protecting them in loss in a way, in a way that makes sense, because there is dissension and it carries over into the match, which allows Riddle to capitalize on the opportunity, right? And that makes sense. That's rooted in logic, and that's fine. Um, you know, Shelton is rolled up after Cedric it does what MVP told him not to do. Then they argue. MVP's like, listen, I told you guys don't argue. We got to do this. Bada boom, bada bing. MVP taps out immediately. MVP can afford to tap out because MVP is not one of the in-ring you know, focused guys of the group. He's just kind of like the, like the leader, the manager kind of thing. And he wrestles when he needs to. So MVP taking a submission loss is fine for me. No problem. Shelton taking a roll-up after Cedric. Um, distraction. That would be fine if it weren't for the fact that it is too early to break up the Hurt Business. Because they're teasing it more and more every week, right? And him getting rolled up after the pin, it makes sense in the whole breaking up the Hurt Business or at least kicking Cedric out of the Hurt Business angle that they're going for. That makes sense, right? I just don't like that they're doing it so early. You know what I mean? I don't like that they're doing it so early at all. Um... You, you could have just done, like, Riddle versus MVP and then have MVP actually kind of be a valiant effort and then lose to Riddle kind of thing with MVP being like, oh, you guys got me this gold, you know, um, Riddle's been barking up our tree for a title match. How about I go beat him down until he doesn't want it anymore? And Riddle's like, hey, you know, if you want a match and you want to get me off the title, if I beat you, I got to get a shot at the title. And they're like, okay, all right, bet right? You could set it up that way with MVP being like, oh, thanks for the gold necklace. I'm gonna go support us and get rid of our pest with Riddle, right? And then Riddle beats uh, MVP, which is fine because MVP doesn't need wins and MVP doesn't really get hurt by losses. You could have just done that and saved Shelton and Cedric from losses given that they're champions, right? 
Um, but they did the gauntlet and the way that they did the gauntlet makes sense with what they're doing. It's just what they're doing. They're doing it way too early. The hurt business is good, but you're making it worse and worse every week to the point that like you're going to break them up way too early. So yeah, I think overall I'm going to give that a down because it does make sense with what they're doing. It's just what they're doing. doesn't make sense to do this early. You know what I mean? I have a lot of like contradicting words in the last like 20 minutes describing the <laughs> the fiend and championship uh thing that i have a problem with and then this hurt business stuff that i have a problem with um so yeah uh we had an edge promo uh where he says that 2020 taught him that you can't sleep on tomorrow if you have a dream if you have something that you want in life um you got to work hard towards it every day uh nothing is guaranteed 10 years ago after mania he went to bed as the champion and then within a week he had to forfeit his title his career and his dream um he said that when he told his mom he wanted to be a wrestler she said go do it and he's like you know those are those are simple words but those words were the fuel um that I used in nine years to get my career and to get my dream back. And then in the greatest match of ever, whatever the fuck it was called against Randy, you know, when he punt kicked me, he reminded me that, you know, it can be taken away, you know, at, at the snap of a finger kind of thing. And then he talks about how he's going to enter the rumble. Uh, but it's not like last year, the stakes are higher because his window, his time to achieve his dreams kind of is dwindling every day. Um, and he's going to win the Royal Rumble. He needs to win the Rumble so he can win back the title that he never lost. Um, and that was the promo. Um, Edge is a great promo. So this was a great promo. Um, this was such a good promo that I kind of want to see Edge win the Rumble and go face Roman. I don't want him to face Drew because I think, honestly, the best thing that you could do with Drew is have him defend the title against Sheamus at Mania. And then you could build to a rematch between Lashley and Drew later on and just be like, a year ago, Drew, you beat me. And since then, you changed me. I'm a monster now. And I'm gonna, I, have a, I have a receipt coming for you. And it's going to come when I take your title. You could, do, you could do a redemption story, but from like the heel face swapped position kind of thing um, after Mania. Uh, and do it like exactly a year apart and have Lashley win a year after he lost to Drew earlier. You know what I mean? You could do something like that and I think that would be really cool. But on the way, you could do Drew and Sheamus. And if you wanted to protect Sheamus, you could do the the interference causing the title change thing with Sheamus and then have them kind of carry their feud onward. But you don't really need to. It's just a possibility. But I think that that is something that could be good. Um, and I kind of want Edge to win the Rumble and go face um Roman now because if you think about it they have a money storyline they have the old face of the company kind of or an old veteran of the company who wants one last run in the spotlight and then you have the guy who carries the company who who doesn't want anybody taking his shit and who's not afraid to put edge out permanently right so you have like sympathetic babyface edge versus roman granted i don't want that more than i want some other things but that's a promo that makes me kind of like not be mad at a wwe championship match for edge in 2021 because as much as i love edge and as much as i loved watching him return last year at the rumble um it's 2021 Edge should not be in a WWE Championship match because he's taking a spot away from a current guy. As much as I love Edge, I, he shouldn't be in a WWE title shot. I think they should do the trilogy with Randy. Um, he won last year at Mania. Randy won at Greatest Royal Rumble. And then he tore his tricep. Greatest Royal Rumble, greatest match ever. Tore his tricep. I think they were going to eventually pay it off at SummerSlam. But, you know, um, so I think after Bray and uh, Fiend and Randy are done, I think they should do... Uh, Randy and Edge at Mania, um, or maybe have like Randy ignore Fiend and then Fiend can like cost Randy or something. I don't know. They could do a lot of stuff, but um, yeah, no, it was a very good Edge promo, which it doesn't surprise me because Edge is a great promo, uh, especially when he has to do like one of those intense promos. He's fantastic. And then we get to the main event of the evening, which was Asuka versus Alexa Bliss for the women's championship. Um, Asuka looks scared again, which 
not great. Um, they had a moment where Alexa throws Oscar to the outside, and then music kind of plays, and Oscar looks into the ring, kind of like what the fuck. And Alexa's rocking on a horse, and then you go to commercial. Um, I like mid match mind games when it when it makes sense and it's good. Randomly being on a rocking horse in the middle of a match with a very clear cut in editing isn't good. That was not needed. You didn't need to go to commercial with that to be like, oh, look how spooky. You already had Alexis Playground. You know Alexis Spooky. You didn't need that. It was needed. It was needless, and it didn't really. It wasn't done well. So it is what it is. Uh, Oscar had a German supla bebe um, against uh, Alexa. Alexa eventually, when she was backed into the corner, turned into Goddess Alexa, and she kind of looked distraught and confused. She was like touching her body and her gear to be like, "Oh, what the fuck? I'm I'm my old self." She was looking around. She's like, "What the fuck is this? What is the Thunderdome? Uh, where am I?" She looked really like dazed and confused, kind of thing. Um, and then Oscar was kind of concerned for her, and then she's like, "You know what? Fuck it. This is just a mind game. I'm gonna go balls do- balls to the wall, figuratively, of course. Um, actually, you don't know, you, but you do know. Uh, fuck me." Why did I? Okay. Um, yeah, goes balls, balls to the wall figuratively, charges her in the corner. Alexa sidesteps her uh, and kind of like drops her into the middle middle rope, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, then Alexa kind of walks across to the other corner. And like as she's walking, she kind of like has this fa- like look of like realization on her face where she's like, oh, I broke free for a bit, but I know what's going to happen. She puts her hands on the on the middle ropes of the opposite corner. Lights start to shut down Alexa Bliss style. She has a cool little uh, music that plays when they happen. Lights come back up, and it's the Fiend version of Alexa that we saw last week. Um, and uh, they redo the whole Asuka going for strikes and then being blocked and ducked. Uh, Asuka goes for the uh, Asuka lock which Alexa fights off and then eventually puts the mandible claw while she's fighting off the Oscar lock. Um, and as the mandible claw is in, Randy Orton face burns and all shows up, RKO's Alexa Bliss, and then they go off the air. Ahem. All right. When they were going into this match, I knew that they were going to have to do something that damaged something. You know what I mean? That was detrimental to something. I knew that they were going to have to make Asuka look bad. They were going to have to make Alexa look bad, one or the other, or both. They did both. And here's why. So you have you have um, a title match, right? Which I'm, I'm not one of those people who's like who says you can't ever have interference in a title match. I'm not one of those people. I think those people are kind of stuck up and stuck in the 70s and 60s when it was perceived to be a shoot brother and, and the characters were all just vanilla garbage. You know what I mean? Um, and a little bit in the 80s. Um, and early 90s, really. Jesus. What a bad time for wrestling, in my opinion. Um, probably not in a popular opinion about the 80s, because a lot of people look fondly on the 80s, but I just, I really don't see the appeal that much, quite honestly. Um, anyways, that's besides the point. I'm not one of those people who think you can never have interferences in title matches, and that it always has to be a clean finish in a title match, because it's a title match, God damn it. Um, because if you think about it, if there's the proper motivation for a character to interfere in a title match, they will. This is not a UFC fight where it's a cage and you're going to get suspended for interfering and jumping the cage and there's security blocking you, a performer, from jumping the cage. It's professional wrestling. It's not fucking genuine combat. It doesn't need to be booked that way. It doesn't need to be singles matches every week and then you can only have the one match once a year and then blah, 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 blah. That's boring. If Because like... The UFC works because it's real, because there's only one pay-per-view, uh, like once uh, once a month that you can watch one guy, essentially, or actually a few times a year that you can watch one guy, but wrestling is weekly, wrestling has characters, wrestling has storylines, you don't need to have the whole, okay, he needs to win the championship match to get the championship match, and then the championship match can have no interference, not allowed, I don't care right? If you do it every week, if you have a championship match and every single championship match you haven't interfered with, you know, then it kind of is like, okay, why am I going to watch the match? Because it's not going to have a proper conclusion. But every now and again, if it serves a story, I do not mind a interference. If you have somebody who feels like they wrongfully got screwed or overlooked for a title shot and you're going to start a rivalry with that person and the champion and the champion has a title match against somebody else, 
have the guy who feels overlooked interfere and be like, hey, I'm going to fuck up your show, general manager, unless you give me a title shot or have him cut a promo with the champion. And if it's a, if it's a face champion, have the champion be like, you know what? OK, I'll fight you kind of thing. You know what I mean? That makes sense. Um, what they had to do pretty much was damage control this week because they booked themselves into a lose lose. And they were like, okay, we'll get out of the lose-lose by just having a one-lose, but they had a double loss anyways. Asuka was scared, which doesn't make her look good. Asuka, in turn, had to look weak because they turned Alexa into Fiend Alexa. And Fiend Alexa is an otherworldly being, a non-human being who no-sells everything, so she should be beating the fuck out of Asuka. The thing is, Asuka should not be made to look weak by anybody because she's the women's champion and Asuka is awesome. And that is where, again, do not intermingle fiend and champion because you have to make the champion look weak to get over properly what you're doing with the fiend but that makes your overall product look bad because then your champion and the reason why everybody's showing up every week is devalued. Now, um, taking the title off of Asuka would be a huge mistake. Putting the title on Alexa would be a huge mistake. Asuka beating Alexa immediately devalues the Fiend version of Alexa, so you have a problem. You either have to make Alexa look really, really, really weak by losing, or you make Asuka look like a piece of shit by losing. Either way, you lose because something gets devalued, and regardless of who came out with the title, you made Asuka look like shit throughout the match because she was terrified. Asuka is the type of person who should not be terrified. If Seth fucking Rollins could be, you know, gung-ho and invading the Firefly Funhouse, Asuka can do much more and not be a fucking terrified person of a Fiend-type character. If Seth fucking Rollins could do that and be fearless, then Asuka 100% should be, okay? But anyways, they book themselves into a little bit of a pickle. You know what I'm saying? A little bit of a pickle. And they have a match where, like I said, if Asuka wins, you immediately deflate Fiend Alexa. If Alexa wins, you devalued your world champion and now you the, you devalued your championship because now it's just a toy, right? So what they did was they had Randy interfere, hit an RKO on Alexa, and then they go to commercial. Here's, or not commercial, they go off the air. The actual logistics of the finish suck because there was no bell rung so there was no disqualification called so there is no retention for oscar they abruptly go off the air they don't even give randy a bunch of time to like look sinister they just kind of rko he stands up he looks down for like two seconds off the air abrupt right so there's no time to linger and get a good shot on randy or not ample time i guess and guess what <laughs> you immediately deflated Fiend Alexa because Randy came in and did a move that knocked her out. This otherworldly being who's supposed to no-sell everything just sold something definitively. <laughs> so it's like, you know what I mean? And like, it makes sense that they had Randy interfere because then they could eventually do Asuka versus Bliss down the line again if they're not going to do Charlotte and Asuka, which I hope the fuck they don't. Um, it's just... It works within the Fiend universe, which is fine, because I want that universe to be booked strong and booked seriously and taken seriously and booked well. The problem is that they're doing it by intermingling it with something that should not be intermingled. Like I've said a million times this episode and you're probably fucking tired of me saying it. And it's just something has to give and it should be a situation where neither of them have to give. Keep them separate. That's just my whole thing. So I didn't like the match itself wasn't even that great because you had a bunch of intermingling little like uh, cinematic stuff that wasn't needed and felt out of place. Um, the goddess Alexa stuff, I don't really understand the purpose of it really. Um, unless it was just like a thing like, okay, Alexa's breaking out. She got control a little bit and then she realizes, oh, I don't actually have control. 
I just had a second of control, but I'm about to relinquish control and I'm going to, you know, give in kind of thing. Maybe it was one of those things where like the real Alexa is still underneath and she broke out for a little bit just to realize she's never going to fully break out. Maybe it was one of those things. Maybe it's like a long-term seed that they planted. Um, Because I think maybe Alexa, when she breaks free from Fiend, whenever that happens fully, um, could go for a title run. You know what I mean? I think that that would be good. As the Fiend, I don't think think so. But um, yeah, I don't like the main event. The title gets devalued. Asuka gets looked like shit. Um the new fiend version of Alexa automatically gets devalued and deflated because of Randy coming in, but you needed Randy to come in because you needed to advance that feud. And then you needed him to cost her a match, but like just cost her a regular match and like just cost her a match as playground bliss, not fiend bliss. And like, I don't know, maybe the logic behind him being able to do offense and her not no selling it, is because he's a dude and that's a that's a girl, but that's a problematic thing to do in the modern day because then the internet's going to come at you. I don't know, man. Raw wasn't good. The finish wasn't good. It was... Again, it's one of those cases where, in my opinion, it was good from one aspect, from a, but from an overall aspect, it's not good just because they intermingled it. If you had had Alexa do what she did with Asuka last week with somebody else, and then do the same thing this week with somebody else, then it's kind of okay. Because you're not making the title look like shit, and you're not making the women's champion look like shit. But you did. So it's not there. It's not that good. I didn't like it. Um, overall, not a great show. Um, Morrison and Sheamus was good. Um, all these promos were good. Uh, the Drew and Goldberg promos were okay. Um, I think what they're doing with AJ is okay. The women's segment earlier on was garbage. Alexa's promo was good for, for the purpose it had to serve, but overall shit just because they intermingled. The main event was shit because they intermingled. It would have been good otherwise. And, uh... Yeah, I mean, the Hurt Business stuff was shit just because they're coming, they're doing what they're doing too early. Otherwise, like, it logically made sense. It's just, why are you doing it this early? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it like a 4 or 5 out of 10. Um, it wasn't like the drizzling shits in my opinion. Ah, 3 or 4 out of 10. <laughs> I just remembered that they're devaluing the women's championship so much. Um yeah, three or four out of ten. I'll, okay, you know, I said four or five, then I dropped a three out of four. Let's just go for a four out of ten. It was bad. It was not good. Um, it got saved by a couple things throughout, which is why it's as high as four. Um, if those things didn't happen or they happened differently, then it would probably be lower. But uh, four out of ten for me. Um, not very good. Let me know what you guys thought down in the comments. Did you like Raw? Um, did you dislike raw? Were you in the middle? And let me know if you agree with me on certain things. Let me know if you agree with me on my opinion about mixing the fiend and the title picture. Let me know if you agree about the hurt business and all that other shit. Um, if you would like to check out some of the other stuff I do on the channel, I do gameplay stuff primarily. You can check out links at the end cards at the end of the video, as well as on the playlist section of my channel. Uh, if you would like to support me in the channel, you can do so over at Patreon. It'll be the first link in the description. Uh, if you would like to follow me on Twitter, you can do so. The link is in the description. Please sponsor me. PC didn't have any for me right now, but you know, uh, I'll keep that motherfucking thing on me. Uh, please sponsor me, PC. Uh, be sure to turn on notifications so you never miss an episode because YouTube likes to zuck your boy and not put my videos in your sub boxes. So by pressing that nice old bell icon, you will get a push notification anytime I do upload and you'll never have to miss it. And uh, yeah, if you guys enjoyed this review, please leave a like, subscribe, share it all your friends, comment down below, all that good shit. And I'll see you guys next time.